So good morning and thank you to everyone for joining our World Green Building Week webinar. Um, we hold these events every year, but obviously um, we can't hold them in person this year, so we're doing it via Zoom. Um, the theme for 2020 is Act on Climate. Um, so that's what Paul and Rob are going to be taking us through this morning. Um, just some kind of housekeeping that the session will be recorded. So if you do need to leave partway through or if you did want to share it with colleagues or anything like that in the future, um, we should be putting it onto YouTube in the next couple of days. Um, if you do have any questions that come up throughout the presentation, there's a Q&A box below. Um, so if you do, just pop them in there and then we should have some time to address questions at the end. Um, so just to introduce you to our speakers, we have Rob Van Zyl, who is the managing partner of Kundal's Birmingham office. Um, and then we have Paul Chatwin, who is our sustainability lead also in the Birmingham office. Um, so I'll just hand over to Rob to take us through the beginning of the presentation. Thank you, Shauna, and good morning to everyone who's, who has joined the call today. Um, today, if, see if I can advance the slide. Today is the second week of uh, World Green Building Week, uh, second day of World Green Building Week, um, and we're delighted to be able to host this presentation. It's certainly a very topical subject and one that's close to our hearts. Many will have watched the David Attenborough program this week uh, or last week, and and uh, you can see how the uh, excitement is building around the world about this whole subject. We at Kundal are committed to achieving ex excellence in this field, and we're delighted to have become both the first carbon neutral consultancy and the first one planet company. Our circa 950 people in 25 global offices have committed to providing excellent green solutions for our clients. And we hope that we'll be able to share some of that with you if I can advance the slide. This presentation is being carried out during Green Building Week in several of our locations. Um, and although in this new virtual world, one could, we could actually join everybody from any part of the globe, this discussion today is primarily for West Midlands professional community. The slides are taking a while to turn. Um, sorry, services, there we go. We need all our disciplines to collaborate to address the climate emergency. And while Kundal offer multidisciplinary engineering consultancy, we achieve the best outcomes when we collaborate strongly with like-minded architects, quantity surveyors and agents, et cetera, and, and all of you in the community. So delighted that you've been able to join us today. The climate emergency requires action across all sectors. And you can see here the sectors in which Kundal operate most frequently. No sector is exempt from having to address the environmental footprint. And we're finding opportunities to do this in most of our sectors, in, in fact, in all the sectors. Right, the climate emergency itself is, um, why can't I get the slides to advance? There you go climate emergency. I'm sure you'll all be aware of the climate emergency and many of you will have seen the BBC documentary last week on extinction in which David Attenborough said that while habitat reduction is the most urgent issue to address, most scientists agree that climate change is a greater long-term challenge. So how are we doing against that? Slide move. I don't know, Paul, if you don't mind advancing the slides, I can't get them to move. We're currently on a trajectory for at least three degrees global temperature rise, which is well above the targets and aspirations of the Paris Agreement. And this will have profound impacts on all of us. It's therefore vital that we act now and we act fast in the hope of alleviating the world's, the worst of the predicted outcomes. In order to re achieve reduction on the scale that's required, we need a complete societal transformation and to flatten the emission curves and to allow our ecosystems to cope. Achieving net zero carbon needs to be at the heart of, of our response to this crisis. Over the past couple of years, we've seen the, the impact of climate change become more severe and widespread from the recent you know, forest fire and bushfires in America, South Europe and Australia, to the flooding we, see, we saw back here in February. Is it vital we act now and we act fast to alleviating the, world's mo the worst of the predicted outcomes? In order to achieve a reduction on this scale, we need a complete societal transformation to flatten the emission curves and allow the ecosystem to cope. 
So what are the drivers for change? What will change us? At the most basic level, government regulation will drive uh, us to improve our game. The UK Parliament, having declared a climate emergency, amended the Climate Change Act and committed the UK to, in June 2019 to reach all the way down to net zero by 2050. Previously, we'd only, they'd only committed to achieving 80% of the way down to net zero. So committing to achieve all the way down to net zero was very ambitious. And unfortunately, the very next month, in July 2019, the Committee for Climate Change reported that we're already failing, falling short of the 80% target. So that implies it'll be very, very difficult to get to 100% of the way, all the way down to net zero by 2050. And this, of course, was before COVID-19 reduced our activity levels, and that has changed, changed our carbon emissions to some degree. The next driver for change really is the local authorities. Um, you, you can see the um, most UK cities have now declared that they'll be carbon neutral well in advance of the 2050 target. So despite the fact that um, you know, we're not on target to achieve zero carbon by 2050 nationally, most cities have committed to achieve it well in advance of that. So by the end of last year, 60% of councils in the UK declared a climate emergency. I think 70% declared a climate emergency. And part of the attraction to cities is that a bold climate change can deliver many benefits many additional benefits for health and well-being, improved air quality, economic savings for individuals and businesses, new jobs, less congestion on the road, and cleaner green spaces. Birmingham City Council has set their ambition to become net zero carbon by 2030. Of course, they've added some political words, let's say, to their statement. Political words such as or as soon as possible thereafter, as a just transition allows, ensuring we reduce inequalities in the city and bring our communities with us. So what that means in political speak is that there's, a, there's an opportunity for them not to achieve that 2030 target if they, if they determine it's unjust. And they've also included in the target offsetting, so planting of trees, for example, can be used as, as a way of offsetting getting to zero carbon by, um, by their own means. The next driver for change, of course, are investors, developers, and occupiers. It's been good to see a swathe of new UK signups to the World Green Building Council Net Zero Buildings Commitment, including most recently Argent, Granger, Jones Lang LaSalle, Lend Lease, SAM, Tritax, Big Box. So there are many, many investors, developers, and occupiers who are now requiring their, their consultants to design buildings that are aiming to become net zero. And uh, this is driving the whole industry quite, at quite a remarkable speed. So now to tell us more about climate triage, I love that title, climate triage, I would, I'd like to introduce Paul Chatwin. Paul has led our Birmingham Office Sustainability team for over 10 years, and he's provided the, the World Green Building Week presentations for several of these years. Paul is passionate about, passionate about delivering zero carbon buildings. He works with clients to achieve, target, achieve their targets, while he still does appreciate the impact commercially, as well as not jeopardizing the occupant's comfort and well-being. So Paul, over to you. Uh, thank you, Rob, and thank you everybody for joining us this morning. Um, I'm going to take you through in the next 20 minutes um, the kind of thoughts uh, of what we believe ACT ON means and how we can actually reduce the carbon footprint of buildings. Um, just anecdotally, um, I've, as Rob mentioned, I've done this presentation for numerous years now. And I remember in 2016, we were talking about how COP21 had been signed and ratified by 174 countries, and we're going to target this one and a half degree or sub two degree average temperature rise. And it was quite, a, you know, quite an exciting time to have that done. And yet four years on, it only feels like in the last 12 months that this act is actually happening. I remember giving this presentation last year and I'd only had a few inquiries in the local Midlands region on net zero or you know, reducing carbon footprints significantly. Whereas this year, um, we've had numerous commissions, uh, about a dozen uh, commissions, a couple of research opportunities, working with colleagues like yourselves in the professional industry to actually come up with products, buildings that can be zero carbon. And it's just, it's just brilliant to be 
you know, in this position of actually acting on uh, reducing our carbon footprint on the buildings. So on with, on with the slideshow. Um, just taking a step back, there, there is 40% you know, of the emissions uh, worldwide is contributed by buildings. So that is why I suppose we uh, you know, wish to focus and do our part in trying to reduce the carbon footprint. And just on the terminology side of things, or just to give, you know, hopefully many of you on this call um, are familiar with these terms. And if you are, I apologize for repeating what you already know, but it's in a way, I suppose, if you are familiar with the terms and getting used to the net zero terms and what it actually means, that's a positive thing, right? Because we're all um, are, you know, taking it in and absorbing it and understanding it and talking the same kind of metrics, the same kind of numbers, which you know, it is great to actually try to go in in a single trajectory rather than having uh, branches up here and there. So advancing net zero is the World Green Building Council's campaign in order to achieve zero carbon buildings in 2050. And that's zero carbon in operation energy as well as the whole life carbon footprint kind of things. With this interim 2030 to try to focus on zero carbon in operation. So I'll talk throughout this presentation about operational carbon, whole life carbon, upfront embodied carbon and there's been several documents issued um, over the past 12 months and probably two years that help give more background and sub substance to this. Anecdotally again um, the World Green Building Council sits above various councils that sit in different regions across the planet. So the UK is actually quite advanced having this commitment by 2050, this legal binding commitment to get to zero carbon. Uh, France is committed to 87% uh, reduction of its emissions by 2050. Um, reading some notes here, Canada has got a 30% reduction compared to 2030. So we really are leading the way a bit. And I see this as an opportunity for us to learn the true cost of applying net zero carbon uh, philosophies to our buildings and sharing that and promoting our uh, local businesses whether it's products uh, and skills in order delivering this so i think this is a really exciting time i suppose so bringing it more locally to the uk um, green building council they released a framework document that's been out now for a while which kind of tells you how to approach a zero carbon development so looking at the green ticks on the right hand side if you're looking at an existing building you can reduce your operational energy you can look at renewables you can then offset and offsets always the thing you do last once you've reduced and then publicly disclose whereas with the new buildings or with major refurbishments you can look at the construction the upfront embodied carbon and try to reduce that then you can look at the big d which is for the operational and the renewables design for um, lower energy use design to integrate renewables before offsetting and before publicly disclosing um, what you've achieved. And we talk about net zero and what does net zero mean? It doesn't necessarily mean you have zero uh, energy use at any point in time or zero energy over a year. It's about a top down and bottom up approach. The top down being let's reduce our carbon footprint of our buildings and the bottom up being when the grid, the UK grid, has more renewables come online over the next decade. Uh, let's try to get our buildings down to match that consumption versus generation. And if we can get to a point where we've reduced our carbon of our operational energy of our buildings, and this is more focusing on operational energy, then we've deemed to do our part. We've, we've made our Paris proof targets, our one and a half degree commitment. We're trying to get down to that point. And the industry, you know, there's various um, bodies that are coming to this kind of what is my reduced operational carbon energy use intensity? What is that figure for a school, for a residential, for uh, an office? And I'll talk more about that later. So LETI, the London Energy Transformation Initiative, this is a graphic from their uh, document that was released this year. And that's uh, a body of independent people, uh, professional buildings, and we were part of professional building engineers, architects, uh, we were part of that team of people, that independent team that put um, together the research to launch this document. And we did various modeling for offices and we showed how you could get from a new office carbon footprint of 160 down to a low energy design around about 55, reducing our carbon footprint by a third by doing various metrics. But if you think about whole life carbon, 
And if you think about upfront carbon, not just the operational carbon that I was talking about on the last slide, then um, you need to consider that as we reduce our operational carbon, the upfront embodied carbon to build our buildings is going to be a larger part of the pie. Uh, to make this a bit simpler, I suppose, if you built a passive house house, the energy in operation is very, very low. But so all of the carbon that's locked up in that building isn't it's operational over its life. It's that initial build. And you can build that passive house out of bricks. You can build it out of timber. And different types of um, methods of construction will have different footprints. So let's just try graphically to talk you through this slide. I'm going to start at the top left, and we're going to just make sure that we're all talking the same kind of language. Again, I apologize if this is um, kind of sunk into most of the audience. If it's sunk into most of the audience, that is a positive thing. So upfront embodied carbon is the cradle to the site. So it's the top three cradle, gate, and site. I've also included there some numbers called A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, which is the RICS um, methodology of assessing carbon, where you can actually break it down into these chunks throughout the line. So the upfront, car um, upfront carbon of a building, a new building, goes from the material extraction to basically the in including the site construction activities. After that time, when you're looking at upfront and embodied carbon, so you're keeping the operational carbon out of the equation at the moment, you've got during the life of that building, that 40, 60, 80 year life, refurbishments, replacements, repair, maintenance, and that all comes into those different metrics there. And then at the end of the life, you've got the energy required and the carbon emissions associated with demolition um, and hopefully reuse and hopefully recycling and a portion of that building going to landfill. When we talk about whole life carbon, the numbers are, we're not as comfortable yet in the industry about what the numbers, what's a good number, what is a low whole life carbon building. So this slide just demonstrates how 46 examples, and you've got the kind of legend at the bottom there about what is included in the whole life carbon. You've got the external works, you've got the facade, superstructure, finishes, uh, demolition and reuse. You can see there that uh, a thousand is the average of these numbers yet Letty is really pushing and saying we need to be driving down to 350 or 600 depending on the time frame so to reduce from 1030 to 600 uh, looking at 40 percent reductions in your whole life carbon your embodied carbon elements is a challenge and we have the tools luckily and we are doing this for clients at the moment and we are writing the rules for the GLA, we've written the rules for the Hong Kong government. Um, so there is skills that are developing across the industry to support these upfront and whole life and body carbon assessments. I'm not going to dwell on this slide too much because I don't particularly like a slide that's got lots of numbers, but if you are a numbers person, have a copy of the slides later and go back to this. But this kind of just, if you look at the source column alone, this just sets out the trajectory that's being talked about by various parties. The GLA, as far as their planning, uh, looking at embodied carbon targets. Letty, I've already mentioned, have got some embodied carbon and operational carbon targets there. The UK government will probably come in some form. Um, there's consultation at the moment. Um, how this is going to impact us? Are we going to change part L? And it's going to be, uh, instead of an energy efficiency target, it's going to be a capped quantum of energy and then you have to offset. Uh, who knows, but that's going to be in consultation and I'm sure that will come. And then you have your operational energy targets by UK Green Building Council. UK Green Building Council um, came up with their framework definition that showed how you should approach reducing your carbon footprint for new builds or refurbishments. But it didn't set out a operational energy cap or limit. So later on, after publishing that framework, they then published for offices what would be a suitable, appropriate cap that you should challenge to get yourself down to, to be deemed to be net zero prior to the using renewables on site or offsetting. So that was to avoid people just offsetting and saying, hey, I'm carbon neutral, even though you may have a quite an energy intensive operational building. We've translated a lot of the guidance into small bite-sized steps. So I'm not going to go into any of these seven items in detail because that will be another hour presentation, but I will just take you quickly through what these steps are. And these are just general good practice design steps. So starting with passive design, looking at orientation, looking at form factor, looking at your 
glazing ratios, looking at the insulation levels, air tightness levels, is all about the passive design. Do the sensible stuff first, hopefully have openable windows as well. Then look to reduce your operational energy demand through energy efficient lighting, energy efficient heating, energy efficient cooling systems, maybe even challenging set points for summertime comfort and wintertime comfort. If you have a greater band of comfort, then you'll have a lower energy uh, in use. And if we are truly wanting to succeed with net zero, then we shouldn't be really burning fossil fuels. But I just want to caveat that, that there may still be a time frame when you don't um, get rid of fossil fuels immediately with your boilers, but you plan to phase out the boilers in, when it comes to the end of its life. So, and hydrogen may come in in the future, the, you know, the jury's still out on that one. So you may still want to keep a gas pipe to your site, but not use it. But then if it becomes potentially viable in the future via a hydrogen source, that may be a, a good scenario. Also with the eliminating of fossil fuels, the benefit of course is less air pollution through the flues from the boilers and combined with a greener transport with electric vehicles, then that helps you know, open up windows more and have a, a, lower, you know, a lower carbon footprint for your buildings, then put your renewables on and then steps five and six is looking at the upfront carbon for your building and looking at the whole life carbon, whole life cost. If you can cost decisions on this structure, that structure type, or uh, this material, that material, or if I, you know, re I might have to spend some here, but I may save some if I have more durable materials, but you can see that upfront during a design period, then you can make you know, an informed decision. So those upfront embodied carbon, the whole life carbon are quite powerful uh, once you've gone through the assessment phase. And then step seven is just tell everybody about it. We are looking to try to get the data onto some a wrap database so that this can inform future decisions and future buildings. So I'm getting close to the next phase, which is rather than um, setting the scene, I suppose, but talking about what action would look like. Um, but this is, a, this is a slide to try to illustrate that if this was an emergency and it was a medical emergency, um, you would do certain steps as a triage. You wouldn't necessarily go in uh, you, you'd have a plan of action. And that plan of action in the built environment world is what buildings are going to be around in 2050. Those are the ones that we need to spend our time and effort on trying to improve and reduce the carbon footprint. The new buildings will be you know, easier to design to be a low footprint, but those existing buildings and particularly the heating demand for residential buildings is the lion's share of our carbon emissions in the built environment. So you focus there. So then, I've, um, this is probably the second, the middle section of my presentation. I'm going to try and make sure I've got time at the end for questions, so I'll try not to ramble too much. But we work with clients, and we look at probably three different, three different elements for clients. Starting at the bottom, you've got the individual buildings. And there's things like the UK Green Building Council framework, the LETI guides I've already mentioned, and the RICS guidance for embodied, calculation, embodied carbon calculations. So there's a lot up there that you can do with passive house as well and consider those systems to reduce the footprint of an asset. If you're looking at portfolio buildings, then you need to work out roughly what your building stock is and they'll have various of ages. It could be various of locations and it's about getting a suitable roadmap and a strategy and an understanding and appreciation of your uh, portfolio, which I'm sure most large portfolio states have got their internal resources looking at this. And following things like better building partnerships, uh, guidance, you can then start addressing your portfolio buildings. But then also at the corporate level, and we've done this for ourselves, you know, as, as Rob mentioned at the start, we're, you know, we've offset, but we've reduced first, and therefore we are a net zero consultancy. And we've had that third party um, checked as well using science-based targets. Science-based targets is an independent um, reviews your methodology, your calculation, have you used the right numbers, have you looked at the right things? And then you know, they, they, they kind of say rubber stamp, yes, you've done the right thing there. And by having a Paris proof target as well means that we are working towards this one and a half degree or doing our part of that one and a half degree. Just anecdotally, in Australia, you can get uh, something called Climate Active and you can certify a product at an event, at an organisation, at a building or at a neighbourhood or a precinct. So Sydney has offset, it's calculated as carbon, it's offset as carbon and that's deemed to be a zero carbon or carbon neutral certification. So there's different schemes and different systems depending on where you are on the planet.
but they follow the same kind of uh, principle. And I, I kind of, I'm repeating myself here, but at a corporate level, you need to assess your carbon, step one. You need to then try your best to reduce your carbon. Today, activity is probably a lesser carbon footprint than what we were doing last year when we all drove into work. We were working from home, but then if this was done at winter, we might all have our heating systems on when they're off. So you reduce your carbon footprint and then you offset and then you report. I've got a slide here just to explain scope one, scope two, scope three. So at a corporate level, you need to understand your footprint. We need to know what's in and what's out. And um, there's a graphic here which will just explain scope one, scope two, scope three. So scope one is your direct emissions. If I'm burning fossil fuels in my boilers or in my fleet of vehicles, that's my direct scope one emissions. You also have an upstream activity of scope two, where if you're burning um, electricity, you're taking electric supply to your building and you're using that for your heating cooling systems. Um, then that is burning fossil fuels at the power station. It may have a mixture of renewables as well, um, but that's your indirect electricity. And then everything else comes under scope three. And scope three can be quite complex. We worked out for our own business that our largest footprint is the business travel and the staff community. It's not our buildings, it's the, our staff community. We also know that where we can do the best benefit is like presentations like today in sharing the stuff that we um, are learning. So you can cut a lot of these out depending on your type of business and then you can focus in on the, the areas that are important to your business. I've mentioned Rick's whole life carbon methodology. I had that in the slide earlier, um, but this just nicely breaks up the upfront embodied carbon, the in use carbon, and you've got water and you've got energy separate there. So operational energy is only one small part of the whole footprint. Water gets rarely mentioned, but it's still important and it's still, it's gonna be a, you know, a scarce resource in the future. And then you can, as a business, once you've gone through the understanding is set yourself targets for reductions. And then you can see how you're comparing your buildings against benchmarks. Um, the case illustrated here is the real estate environmental benchmark, where there's uh, you know, hundreds of buildings publish their data of their portfolio buildings to REAP and then they tell you what is good practice and what is typical practice, what's the top 25%, what's the 50% are. This slide is slightly um, confusing, but let me just talk you through it. If you had five buildings, buildings one to five, and they've got various tenants and landlord energy supplies, you can see the breakdown there. So building two is the worst performing building as far as its carbon footprint. It could be a city center size and it might be uh, less renewables on the building, whereas building one could be totally different and it could be a lower footprint. You can compare that against typical and good practice. Um, energy benchmarks from REAP, so the Retail Environmental uh, Energy Benchmark guidance, and see how your building compares. But there's a new uh, rating system on the block from the Better Buildings Partnership, which is called UK Neighbours Rating, where you get stars for your building. So just on the stars on the right-hand side, just following this one, this is our best performing building, it gets two stars. Whereas these two are starting to get worse, and they're getting minus one and minus two stars. What happened in Australia using the neighbour scheme is they saw 70% reductions on carbon footprints for landlord energy use through having this competitive edge. How many stars can I get for my building? That is slowly, and that, there's been some pilot schemes in London, and that is slowly going to come into the marketplace. So if you're here, UK neighbours rating schemes, my building's getting three stars or four stars. It's something to show off about, tell people about, and it means that you've assessed your building and measured it in operation and it performs well. So let's look at the asset level, which we're probably most familiar with, which is the individual buildings. If you've got a portfolio of buildings, you can do a quick high level asset review. You can look at the seven steps, that, you know, the Kundal seven steps and see approximately where they're performing. And then you can give an overall rating based on that. So that's a very, very simple uh, method of doing a high level asset review. You then need to think about your assets and how you're going to get a path to net zero over a period of time. So there are things, natural things that you can do. You can defossilize and get heat pumps and you can look at fabric and you get natural, you can look at all of these steps, but which one should you do first in order to try to reduce your portfolio, your buildings, energy and carbon uh, emissions is by having a roadmap. Because it could be you know, for the commercial office building, it could 
be totally dependent on when lease expires and you've got the ability to do something with your building. I've got a case study later, which I can probably talk a little bit more about this, where we've already been commissioned to do part of this for a site in Birmingham. So um, for, I have actually got one case study now. I'm just checking ahead, yes, I've got a couple more slides. So this is a case study, um, which I mentioned previously on the previous slide. Um, the client came to us and they were looking at just the plant replacement of a very large scale office building in Birmingham. Um, we looked at the REAP benchmark, we had their energy data and we created a digital twin. We simulated both using IES software and simulated using spreadsheets and met with their facility staff, talked about the operational energy. And this is a VAV system. So for the building services guys out there, this is an air-based system that provides comfort to the building and you vary the air and you can actually use more outdoor air when the temperature's right outside in order to condition your building. VAV is a historic method of um, providing comfort to offices. It's not the one that's been done primarily over the past decade, I'm going to say, which is more of a fan core unit or a VRF refrigerant based system. Um, but it was favored going back probably two decades. So this was, and this system actually for COVID sake, because the windows are shut here, but you can get more air into your building if you wanted to um, by increasing the air supply and getting what's called uh, free cooling. But it performed okay. It, it performed quite well with the replaced plant and the replaced strategies. But what we did discover through this exercise was our 263 uh, energy, you know, kind of still far away from the 55 for a new building zero carbon definition but it was between the top 25th and the 50 percentile on the reeb and the, what we discovered was it was all heat it was so hard that the fabric until we replace the fabric we cannot drastically or significantly reduce our um, heat input into that building and this allows now the client to take that model and to take it forward and to when they decide to do something with the fabric when it comes to the end of its life then is the time to do it it may be that the plant we put in now has a life of 20 30 years so it may be at 2040 2050 which is when a holistic change is done to that estate lastly or last but one this is a slide that just tells us about the operational energy quick wins and considerations for what is we feel is the where we need to be spending most of our efforts, which is the existing building stock. So again, I won't go through this line by line. It's pretty common sense stuff when you look on the left-hand side, switching things off. The key considerations on the right-hand side, uh, if we can open up windows, even if we can't open the windows now because it's polluted, but if we can at least provide openable windows, that is a good thing to do. So if we can get that just one thing, that one message from this presentation about having openable windows and the right amount of glass on our facades, that would be a good start for 10. And then lastly, um, yeah, we, we can provide support with all of this. We know that a lot of clients have in-house uh, resource people that are looking at this and, you know, and advising their board members but we'd love to be working with your teams and supporting you doing some of the analysis sharing some of the experiences that we're doing across a range of projects now with different clients in order to try to you know, reduce our carbon footprint so just a nice graphic there to um, conclude on. The cost of inaction is greater than the cost of action. Um, this will be possibly a tax in the future by UK government. Um, please do get your questions in. I hopefully, Sean has got some questions that you have been sending in. If you don't want to raise a question now, I would say you know, gladly have a chat or you know, ping a message to um, Condor on this later and we'll try and get our responses back to you if there's a question that you even think about later. I hope that's been of uh, use to you. I'm going to stop speaking now and hand back to Shauna to field any questions. Thank you Paul. Um, yes we have had a couple of questions through. Um, so there's one here from Kerry Mashford, which is, what is Kundal's view of the measurement, monitoring and verification of carbon slash operational energy? Keen to understand if this is assumed from design or from evaluation. It's a good question, Kerry. Thank you. Operational energy, um, measure, monitor um, and verify. 
the clients I just spoke about, my favorite job, in, the commission includes for us to monitor for the 12 months. So has it performed exactly as we intended? We have a digital twin. Uh, that digital twin comes at a cost though. So to inform a design at the start, um, you can do high level appraises and apply good practice but you won't get a definitive number. Um, if you want to get down to the net zero then, and you want a definitive number, you can then appoint um, an embodied calculation, whole life calculation, operational energy calculation to really inform that. And the earlier you do that appointment, the greater that that tool can be used to inform the design process. Um, but it is a catch 22 in, in, in a way in that it does take time and it does take you may not have the definitive design at the start so it, it's trying to use the tools that are available um, i don't know if that's answered the question um, there are if you want accuracy in energy calculation for operational energy which the question was more focused on operational energy you can do a sibsi tm54 energy assessment a sibsi tm54 energy assessment is good it the only weaknesses is in the controls of the hvac the heating vent and air conditioning plant Whereas if you do a more robust digital twin using design for performance methodology, which was applied in Australia and has been applied to the UK over the last year, you will get the detail in the building services control and operation. So if you want to relax set points and see the impact that has, if you want to make a change to the lighting system, if you want to make a change to the amount of uh, windows and roof lights, then you can see the impact that has on that. Hopefully that's answered the question. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> we have another one here from Stuart, which is embedded carbon is a problem with many materials production. How do you see carbon being taken out of cement and steel production? I would refer you to Chan. Um, Chan is our specialist in embodied, um, embodied carbon. Um, there are the usual cement replacements GGBS and uh, PFA. Um, you need to speak to the structural and the civil engineers. On the projects that I'm working on at the moment where embodied carbon is being factored in, there is limits on the curing times, I believe it is, or there is, you know, again, our structural engineers are the best place to sit, but there is limits on what you can do as far as replacement for, say, a slab compared to a wall. So it's important that you understand these. Any kind of replacements as well is a cement replacement. Cement is a significant carbon uh, footprint. So any cement replacement is a, a good thing. Steel is a, a brilliant question. Uh, my, my view on steel is that you tag every steel that you use and you'd be able to reuse that when you deconstruct the building and you bolt it all together and it doesn't get melted down at the end and recycled into rebar or a lower grade steel. I suppose a lower grade steel is a, still a better place to have than it going you know, into landfill. Um, but steel, again, is a high carbon uh, footprint. We're seeing um, tim uh, timber steel hybrid uh, constructions being quite good at reducing the embodied carbon footprint while still maintaining a sensible design approach to spans and costs. So uh, timber is the, you know, the panacea, I suppose, for a low carbon, embodied carbon, but um, you do need to be careful that I'm getting the, some feedback here from a colleague as a structural engineer, or at least a structural engineer. So steel electric art furnace techniques have been developed for lower embodied steel, carbon steel. So you can generate steel with a lower carbon footprint depending on the way it's manufactured. So again, engage your structural engineers um, to not discount steel and go straight for timber if it comes at a cost penalty, but to engage with maybe where is that steel? And I suppose that's a contractor and that's a supply chain engagement as well. And procurement then comes into it. And you know, procuring the supply chain earlier on, the contractors early on, can help massively um, realize real benefits. I'm going to start waffling. Uh, any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank uh, you, Tim. I keep coming through. Um, there's another one from Stuart. So I have considerable user resistance to widening set points. Any suggestions on how to overcome? 
The, the resistance on winding set points is, is, is maybe that's a step too far for some clients. Uh, let's design. I think if, I, if we stick with an office and we just say, let's design to BCO guidance. BCO guidance is good. BCO guidance is very good, but it does have that banner of trying to catch the majority of users. It does have flexibility in its, uh, if you apply it appropriately, you can have, um, you don't over design the services, but you can agree um, set points and temperatures with the client on board, with the client understanding the impact that may have on the comfort levels. I don't, and I, uh, Rob introduced me at the start, and one of the things I wanted to make, make sure on is at no point do I say that we have reduced comfort in order to reduce carbon. We should be able to have comfortable, healthy, low carbon buildings. So the set point is, is an interesting debate. It's an interesting discussion. It's one that should be discussed in my, my view and it should be one that is understood. And maybe the infrastructure is allowed where you can increase um, the cooling or the heating systems uh, once in occupation, if need be, once you know that tenant. There is always, on the flip side of that, I don't like um, designing things in when you don't know what they actually are. So it's nice to have a set agreed parameters on temperature set points and what you're going to use for equipments or lighting as far as watts per square meter rates, allowing flexibility at central plant compared to terminal plants and agreeing those at the day one so that you don't jeopardize comfort, but you've got flexibility in your building to adapt to a high energy use type of client or tenants to a low energy use tenants. You may in the future, uh, Rob had one of the sliders on the drivers has changed, the uh, tenants coming to you saying, what are you doing, Mr. Landlord? What are you doing in order to reduce carbon footprint? And if you can say, well, we designed the building to have less plant at day one, but with the capability of adding uh, some plant, simply space, power distribution, maybe some drainage distribution, but having some sensible strategy to counter for that. That's my view anyway. Um, <clears throat> thank you. We do have a couple of more. Um, so from Carol Costello has asked, when advising clients on a path to net zero, how do you consider user behaviour? For example, agile working, commuting options and business travel. Path to net zero. Um, if you're doing a corporate level assessment, um, then you do need to understand their business and corporate usage. Um, I'm not sure that, again, on the, the corporate side of things, it's, it's, you've got to make sure that you have the right numbers. And there's a few slides at the beginning when you're looking at corporate footprints is using the right numbers. Agile working um, will mean that you have a smaller asset. A smaller asset uh, is a good thing, I would have thought, because it would have less carbon, it's more flexible. Um, so I'm all for um, agile working policies. And if you design a building for all of the staff to be there all of the time. Um, it doesn't, doesn't work. I was with one particular council and they're looking at moving their council um, offices from their existing council building to a repurposed building. I don't want to say any more than that. Um, but the whole occupancy density and the whole numbers, it, it, we have this on a lot of projects this year. How much air do we provide? How, how big do we size the systems for how many people in that building? Uh, that can have a big impact, that can have a big impact. And it, yeah, it is only one that the understand, getting under the footprint of, getting under the skin of the client and understanding how they use that building. Um, and architects are probably better placed, or some of the architects I spoke to are better placed at doing that exercise and modeling those buildings appropriately for agile working or the right seats, so yeah. Sorry, the fire alarm has just started going off, just a test. Um, and then we have one more from Fabian, which is, as a landlord, you sometimes only have direct power over common areas, not exactly on tenant areas. How is Kendall's view on possibilities on collaboration with tenants? For example, supporting their initiatives, guiding them, green leases and quick wins, especially on a global basis with different market practices and legislation. I know it's not a technical task, but maybe within those case studies, the tenant engagement is, in covered, is covered too. So yeah, it's a good valid question. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to answer this one fully, but um, lease agreements are made and lease agreements are fixed with terminology of comfort 
and when you can have that comfort. Um, if the tenants and some tenants will be, you know, regardless of what is in the agreement, they'll be maybe an energy hungry. They maybe don't care. And I don't want to say that too much because it sounds negative, but you will have a few tenants that won't care. And then you'll hopefully have more tenants that do care. So I think you've kind of mentioned it. It's, it's that, um, it's that understanding that conversation, that work stream with the tenants to say, well, if you come in the weekend, um, are you happy if I don't run the ventilation plant, knowing that you've got five people in an office of, it, there's, there's one caveat, I suppose, with the COVID thing, which is it's a good thing to have ventilation plants. So I think at the moment, um, there may be a good reason, to, more than energy in order to run that plant. But COVID to one side, um, having that conversation and understanding if they come in, they don't have the ventilation plant running, they can switch on localized heating and cooling and it's localized to where they sit. You know, if you give, does the, does the landlord have the power over the thermostat or do you give that power of the thermostat to the tenant? Uh, do you let them, part of the agreements, have a reduced rate or a reduced cost of their utilities? Do you share the savings if they reduce their operational energy? Um, because they're mindful and they want to do the right thing. How do you separate that amongst multi-tenanted buildings if you haven't got the meters in place? So there's, there's challenges, not barriers, but there's challenges to overcome and there's discussions to have. And each individual building, each individual tenant needs to have that conversation with the landlord in order to work out what is the best strategy and then when you come to replace systems in that building or control systems, controls are probably the first thing to go out of uh, date with software and the like if there is ways of improving that software or ways of even power giving the tenant uh, a billing meter directly um, then they can do their bit or you can work with them to to read a meter we i i've spent many years reading my landlord's meter and asking to go into the plant room and reading it on a monthly basis and the reason we did that as a one planet consultancy is so that we could actually have that conversation with our landlord as a tenant and say to them by the way, do you know your footprint's quite high in this region or that region, uh, or compared to this benchmark or that benchmark, so we could support the, the landlord with um, reducing their footprint? I don't know, across the planet as well. Is it, yeah. We're fortunate that we have got uh, people like myself and teams and engineers. Um, our Australian business is primarily been uh, started on sustainability we have more sustainable engineers in the australian business than we do in the uk business so um yeah we can support with that like to support with that of course um, <clears throat> that's all the kind of questions and comments we have time to go through this morning there is a couple of you that have sent in some comments and things um and i've made a note of those and um, we'll get Paul to come back to you kind of directly and have a chat with you about those. Um, but I'd just like to thank you all for joining um, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Bye. Thank you.